What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith, hanging out with Queen's own Sasha Jenkins. Sasha, how are you? I'm well. Thanks so much for coming in. You know your name? I thought you were a DJ. I thought I was walking into a room full of turntables. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's all good. <laughs> well, we're here for some good conversation. And we're talking music, too, of Mike's and Man. Congratulations on the docuseries. Thank you. And this is a long time coming for you. You've covered hip-hop for a really long time. So wind it back for me. Take me back to, to being a kid and growing up with hip-hop. Who were some of your guys growing up that you liked? Well, you know, ironically, me and myself and a gentleman named Nasir Jones, a.k.a. Nas, mm. we went to the same junior high school. Oh, wow. Uh, and these other guys, a group called Mob Deep. Mm. Um, I met Havoc from Mob Deep writing graffiti on the side of the subway train <laughs> in 1987. Wow. So, you know, I moved to New York in 1977 from Silver Spring, Maryland, and my mother told me to go outside and play. I had mm. a Nerf football. Other people had magic markers. There was music in the park, and I didn't know what it was, but what it was was hip-hop. Mm. You know, before it was a corporate powerhouse, right. this is what we did in New York City as kids on the streets. You know, we had music in the park, we had our own art form, we had our own dance. So this is how I was raised. You know, hip hop has become a part of my identity and it's how people around the world identify themselves. Yeah, it's awesome. How about Nas as a kid in junior high? What do you remember about those times? Well, I was uh, a year or two beyond him. I didn't really know him specifically in junior high, but we had a lot of we mutual had a, friends. Bil a billion mutual friends, but he dropped out in like the seventh mm. grade, you know? I mean, that decision worked out for him. Well, it's funny because we had the same experience. Our guidance counselor told us the same thing, that we should go to vocational school. Mm. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with vocational school. We need people who know how to fix things. Right. But what if Nas would have gone to vocational school? Yeah, we would have lost a huge and impactful artist. Yeah, and, and so in New York City public schools then, we had babysitters. Mm. You know, no one had any expectation for us. So the fact that someone like Nas could become this prolific poet who's writing has influenced people around the world coming from the Queensbridge housing projects where today the average family makes sixteen thousand mm. dollars a year that's a powerful statement definitely and it's not something that guidance counselors are pumping up no <laughs> no but now I think it's a little bit of a different story at least there are people from that area who have made it but at the same time I'm sure there are still people that are hesitant to say hey you should go for this music career because there's nothing guaranteed oh no and 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 that's the magic of you know being at the right place at the right time but also having a dream mm. and sticking with it. And all of us have so many different distractions that get in the way of our dreams, but those of us who are fortunate enough to stick with it, sometimes the dream comes to life, yeah. in real life. And it certainly happened that way for the guys from Wu-Tang Clan. I mean, thinking about their backgrounds from Staten Island and Brooklyn, like these were rough neighborhoods as well. So you've known these guys for a really long time. So take me back to meeting them in the 90s and, and giving them their first album, uh, magazine cover. Well, you know, a friend of mine, his name is Mike McDonald, he was doing radio promotions at the time, which means he would get songs and go to radio stations in different places to sort of spread the word, record stores. And at the time I had a newspaper called Beatdown that mm -hmm. I published with a childhood friend who I grew up with in Astoria, Queens. And, uh, on one of our missions to promote the newspaper, we ran into Mike McDonald and he said, hey, there's, this, you know, my boys, they have this, this, this group, Wu-Tang, check them out. So he gave us a cassette, a cuss single, <laughs> and, a, and a piece of vinyl, and we won in our rental car because we were going around to stores delivering newspapers, mm. and we put it in, and the song was Protect Your Neck. Mm. And we both looked at each other like, what the hell is this? <laughs> but it was, it was, there was something about it that was really attractive, and for me, as someone who also spent time on the punk scene in New York, um, the guitars and the, and the energy of that song just felt very punk to me. There was something about it that drew me in. Uh, there were no hooks. Mm. It was just a bunch of guys talking at you. And there was nothing pretentious about it at a time when hip hop was starting to get really polished and sort of conscious of its presentation, you know, becoming more professional. Here you have these guys who like, are rapping in their bedroom and they don't really care that it's not perfect. Right. Yeah, and there's a purity to that too, especially at that time when things are getting more corporate. So mm -hmm. when you think about the impact of the group, how did they resonate with so many people at that time and still today, but especially during that time? Well, that's 90s. my big question. That's why I wanted to make this film or this series. How is it that people in Poland or all over the world connect with Wu-Tang, and yeah. I'm from Queens, right? And, and Staten Island, as a New Yorker, is like a foreign place. Right. Like, I'd never been to Staten Island until Wu-Tang. Wow. Like, they had this event called Park Hill Day, which was, in their neighborhood, they would have this, like, you know, block party, mm -hmm. right? And when 
um, Wu-Tang first hit, I went to like the first Park Hill day when they were sort of starting to make it. Wow. And that was my first trip to Staten Island <laughs> in my life. I had no reason to go there. So looking at how far they've come and knowing where they've come from, such humble beginnings, and me being a New Yorker and sometimes not understanding what the hell they're talking about, mm. how is it that so many people around the world connected with what they were saying? Yeah. And so that was what was fascinating to me. And I felt like if I made a film that sort of explored all the things that they were a reaction to or all the things that they were a, fle a reflection of, their neighborhood, their community, their personal lives, spending a lot of time on that, that will give all of us a better understanding of the genius of these guys, all the things that they had to overcome to become who they became, mm. and to see how this sort of family unit, this clan, these guys, some of them uh, are related by marriage, a couple of them are cousins, but ultimately a family that they chose. How did this family come together, stay together, and create this monolithic voice that resonates with so many people. Yeah, it's a really fascinating story. And for you to unpack that, I mean, just take me through the whole process because you've known these guys, you covered these guys, you still had to convince these guys that you were the right guy to tell this story. So right. what was the pitch in order to get the job done? Well, myself and RZA share the same agent. So my agent says, hey, you know, Wu-Tang, RZA's ready to sort of have their story tell. The, are you interested in putting your hat in the ring? I said, sure. So I flew out to LA for the day expressly to meet RZA. I was gonna get on a plane, meet him, and get right back on the plane. And I met with him, and he said, yeah, I'm ready to finally tell this story, and you know, I'm looking at a few different production companies. Mm. And I said, you know, you can go with any number of high-budgeted, big brand name uh, production companies in Hollywood, and you'll have a fine film, but it ain't gonna be what I'm gonna do, dude. Mm. What I'm going to do is going to be the real thing. And there are things that I see that other people don't that are going to make this thing special. That's a good pitch. And he pitch. said, it, it took about a week and a half or something like that. And then RZA recently told me that he ran it by his wife. Oh, wow. And his wife said, give it to that guy. Mm. So I, I want to thank RZA's better half uh, because she was the one who gave me the thumbs up to get the gig. That's awesome. Yeah. You needed her. I, he, he needs her more than me, but I'm, I'm thankful. <laughs> that she was kind enough to say that, give this guy the shot to yeah, do it. Yeah, that's awesome. So you get the project. When do you realize this is a four-part docu-series as opposed to just a straight documentary? Well, there's just so much to cover. There's yeah. 25 years of the group's history. There's 25 years of New York history. There are you know, their influences. The 5% Nation, which was an organization, a, a sort of a, a fraternity, a, a sort of a cultural and spiritual belief system that was founded on the streets of New York City that had a heavy hand in their lyrics and some of the things that they believed in. Like, no one knows much about the 5% Nation, and I felt it was important to spend time on the 5% yeah. Nation. So with all the things that are rolled up into who they are, there's no way you can do that in an hour and 25 minutes. No, you really need the time to unpack it. Yeah. So what was most interesting for you? Because you knew the story, you knew the guys, but I'm sure you learned some new stuff along the way. So what really piqued your interest? Well. The level of brotherhood and family, you know, it's well known that they've had their conflicts and their issues, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when it comes to business. You know, RZA and his brother, Divine, they're sort of on the business side of it, right? And so RZA wears many hats. On mm -hmm. one hand, he's the businessman. On the other hand, he's the artist. So he, RZA has this constant conflict of being this businessman and like, you know, he's got to answer to his brother or work with his brother and then the artist who has to mm -hmm. work with the other guys in the group. So seeing that conflict within RZA and then also seeing how, all the, how the, all the guys deal with it and sometimes you know the outcome isn't always the best or they're not always happy but at the end of the day there is this brotherhood that they share. At the end of the day as you God says hey a lot of stuff was messed up but these guys are my family. Mm. Who else can say that they've known guys since kindergarten? Not too many people. You know so in any family, blood family, people don't get along, right? Yeah. Blood family, people have disputes over money. So when you consider the fact that these guys, through thick and thin, even when they don't agree, are still able to come together and still have love for one another, that's a powerful, powerful uh, story. Yeah, I mean, you think about some of the best musicians, some of the best groups of all time, 
they had their downfalls, they broke up. Same with sports teams. You think about championship teams, they eventually hit the skids. Right. These guys kept it going. Right. And it really just goes to show that you need that brotherhood in order to get through all the different crazy stuff in this business. Well, I think that they're also blown away by what's happened to them. And I think that they're humbled by it. Mm. That's the only way they've been able to sort of stay together through thick and thin thinking about where they came from, thinking about all that they overcame. And if you see the four-part series starting May 10th on Showtime, you will, you will learn all that they overcome. You will learn all that they overcame to become who they've become. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So from being in the bedroom to where they are now, where do you think was the turning point and really making them a mainstream group and an all-time group that people are still talking about? Well, there was a tour that they went on, even though it collapsed, with a group called Rage Against the Machine, mm -hmm. which was a big stadium tour. And that introduced them to an even broader audience uh, beyond the, the traditional hip-hop audience. That went a long way, even though this, the tour came apart, that went a long way in sort of picturing them next to these iconic rock groups who have a very broad reach. Right. And Rage Against the Machine being that they were a bit of a hybrid, there was, you know, Zach was a front man who was essentially an MC. Mm -hmm. It was a perfect fit. And the energy and the spirit and tonality of the, both of those groups coming together was really powerful. Well, you mentioned something before about how you were listening to the cassette, and that was the first time you guys were interacting with them. You think about people today, it's like, if they've never heard of Wu-Tang, they're going on Spotify and listening to them for the first time. Right. So what's it like for you to see it go from that pure experience where it's you and your friend in the car to now people just can be anywhere and listen to their music at any time? Well, you know, the... The W logo the, is so iconic. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are people, you can't, uh, you know, my office is on Broadway. And if I stand outside of my office on Broadway in Manhattan, within 10 minutes, I'm going to see at least one Wu-Tang shirt. Mm. So Wu-Tang represents so much more than just music at this point. And that's the other thing. Like, around the world, Wu-Tang, that W was uh, someone's entree into hip-hop culture. So when people see that W, they're not just thinking a musical group. They're thinking so much more than that. And that is, so in this climate where like you can just press a button and hear their whole catalog, there's still this sense of like Wu-Tang represents more than just listening to someone's catalog on Spotify. Mm. There's, more, there's way more to it. And I think the authenticity of their storytelling and the manner in which they made their music. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't polished. I mean, people, when, when RZA first did what he did, so many of his contemporaries who were producers were like, Yo, I, what, what is he <laughs> doing? That's wrong. Yeah. You need to fix that. Right. And he said no. And, it, and that was also a part of his development. I think part of it was he was still learning hmm. and, and didn't care about it being perfect. He cared about the spirit of how it all came together and what it represented. And he had the vision and the foresight to understand that that's all that mattered. What matters is the energy and the spirit of what you're making. You know, you know uh, an artist like Neil Young, who's one of my great inspirations, mm -hmm. he'll tell you that his music is imperfect. Mm. It, that's what makes it human. That's what makes it special. That take that he chose, that wherein you hear the microphone drop, that's what made that take special. And RZA understood that. Yeah, it's organic, and that's what people can connect to. And I think it's really interesting because you mentioned the symbol and the logo. You think about the greats in hip-hop. I mean, they're usually individuals. Biggie, Tupac, Jay-Z. Like, it's not the group in the same way. Right. So how do you factor that in in terms of where they rank as a group compared to individuals in the rap game? Well, that's another thing. They are a throwback because originally there was, like, Grandmaster Flash mm -hmm. and, you know, the Furious Five. You know, the, the original rap groups were right. multiple people multiple in guys. the group. Yeah. So they were a, a throwback when they did what they did. First of all, nine guys or ten guys was just crazy. Right. But like at that point, that sort of original era of groups with multiple guys rapping had been long mm. dead. So they were really a throwback to the original sort of MC party rocking groups who emulated, who wanted to be like Parliament Funkadelic, who wanted to be bigger than just guys rapping in a project banquet hall, you know? Um, losing my train of thought, what were we talking about? Just in terms of the group compared to individuals. But right. I, think, I think you hit it there. Right, but the, but the power of, the, you know, so who else is there? Beastie Boys? Like, right. Great. You really Beastie think Boys? of, yeah, you think of rock groups who may cross over, but right. they're not a lot of people that Cypress are in the groups. Hill. Yeah. You know, another great group, Beastie Boys. These are great right. groups, you know, who have had uh, amazing impacts globally. But... I would argue that Wu-Tang is the greatest 
rap group of all time. I mean, if guys from their bedrooms in New York can impact people in Poland, that's yeah. really saying a lot. Yeah, but, you know, Beastie Boys did that and sure. Cypress Hill did that. But I think when you look at all the circumstances and all the things that they overcame to become who they became, um, you know, my vote personally is for, for Wu-Tang. We don't all have to agree, and that's what makes hip-hop in America special. Mm -hmm. You can have your own vote. But I think uh, after seeing this four-part series, I think anyone can watch it and know nothing about Wu-Tang mm -hmm. or hip-hop and come away feeling something. Yeah. That was my goal. No doubt. So May 10th is coming. May 10th. You mentioned it. It's obviously going to be exciting. What are a couple of big things you want people to take away? Maybe a little under the radar that they may not immediately know about the group. Under the radar that they don't know about the group. Um, well, the Wu-Tang, the story of the Wu-Tang logo, again, if you look at other iconic musical logos, right? You've got the Rolling Stones, lip and tongue, yep, tongue. kind of thing. Yeah. You, the, the Grateful Dead have their dancing bears mm -hmm. if you want to go deep with it. But the, the, the humble beginnings of the Wu-Tang logo, you know, that story is told in the film and it's just unbelievable. You know, and, and, and the notion of no one knew what was going to happen, even though Rizzo says, oh, I had a plan and I knew this was going to happen. He can say that. <laughs> I'm not taking that away from him. But the folks behind the scenes who are making the music with him and the gentleman, their DJ, Mathematics, who crafted the logo, mm. you know, you see these very humble sketches of what <laughs> the other versions of what the W almost was. Mm. And he's flipping through the book, and he's like, nah, that wasn't going to cut it. And then you see him telling the story and drawing it again. It's just a wow. simple idea that has conquered the world. That's really cool. You know? How about the name of the series, Of Mikes and Men? How'd you come up with it? Well, um, Of Mikes and Men, to me, Wu-Tang, they're not just a black group, mm -hmm. right? They're an American group. Yeah, no doubt. And I think in so many instances, as black artists, as black creators, you know, we get pushed into Black History Month. Don't get me wrong, that's nice that we have the shortest month in the year to mm -hmm. celebrate all that we've done. But, like, let's look at it this way. This is American history. You can talk about Wu-Tang any day of the week, not just in February. Yeah, no doubt. Right? So, Of Mice and Men mm -hmm. is an American classic. It's a classic American tale, and the Wu-Tang story, to me, is a classic American tale. And that sort of idea of cementing their identity in the American consciousness, not just in the black American right. consciousness, in America's consciousness, is very important to me. We have to start looking at our artists as American artists, as contributors to American history and American culture. And that was my goal with that title. Yeah, I think it's, it's perfectly stated. Thank you. Sasha, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks so much. Of Mikes and Men, May 10th on Showtime. See you next time here on The Sit Down.